All right, guys, it's all your show. Take it away. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I'll kick this off, and uh, it, it, it would be great for us to hear who is on the line. Um, but oh. to, before that, I'll just give you a quick intro on us. Um, sure. Amanda Stangus and I uh, represent the principles of Starling Advisors, and we work uh, exclusively, really, with federally qualified health centers and primary care associations throughout the country, <clears throat> specifically focused on uh, the impact the Affordable Care Act and other related uh, legislation are having uh, on health center operations and, and, and really the uh, strategic benefit of getting health centers thinking more uh, seriously about working together uh, you know, as they kind of navigate those waters. So we're going to talk about a bunch of different strategies today, but that gives you a little background on where we come from, just uh, the two-second uh, background on myself. I've, I've spent most of the last seven years um, doing this work and working with federally qualified health centers, uh, focused on things like health information technology, the implementation of the patient-centered medical home, um, and most recently, uh, forging and, and, and maturing relationships with uh, managed care companies. And that'll take a variety of different forms, many of which we're going to talk about today. Um, Amanda, do you want to just say a few words? Sure. Um, I have been with Starling pretty much from the beginning. Um, like Andy, my career for the past seven or eight years has been focused on health centers and networks of community health centers. I spent about six years at the California Primary Care Association, um, where uh, much of my experience dovetailed uh, a lot of the content areas that Andy just discussed, and actually that's where he and I first met. Um, lots of focus on um, implementation reform, particularly around things like the uh, gearing up for the benefit exchanges, um, IT and data planning, patient-centered health helm, all those same sorts of things. Um, I also have um, another area of expertise, which is I also work on sort of the integrated um, oral health and behavioral health side of things as well. And a lot of times that becomes important when we start thinking about what network development might look like in the various states. Um, let's see. I think I'll leave it at that except to say that I think part of what I, I really bring to these discussions, um, both with the staff at the PCA level as well as um, with your membership is, um, you know, I Truthfully, guys, I sat exactly where you sit. I, I understand the complexities of working with um, membership organizations and membership organizations that are going through a lot of change that may or may not always be comfortable for them. Uh, lots of experience in working with boards and the health center boards and understanding what some of their strengths and limitations are. A lot of what Andy and I talk about um, can sometimes feel a little overwhelming to folks, both at the staff and at the health center level. And, you know, part of the reason that we sound so conversant and confident, obviously we've got a lot of content knowledge and a lot of expertise, but we also talk about it a lot in a lot, in a lot of different settings. So, you know, right, I mean, before Andy gets us kicked off with the slides, you know, I just really want to say um, – how important and really how valuable it is for us to really have this time with the staff and as well as being able to interact with the members. It really gives us an opportunity to hear from you um, what you think some of the challenges are that are facing the PCA as well as facing some of the members because we will talk a little bit today um, and as we go through this process with you guys, what the evolving role of the PCA potentially could be moving moving um, through this journey together. So um, as much as possible and as artificial as it seems in this strange format where I'm in California, you guys are, and you are in one part of the um, eastern seaboard and Andy is up in Boston, I really do want this to be a, a dialogue as much as possible. So with that, Andy, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Andy and Amanda. Really appreciate it. Um, so on our side, it's Jeanette and myself. Um, we will have probably Betsy Wheeler giving a call in in a few minutes. Um, Jeanette is um, here with me at the association, and he kind of um, handles a lot of the data 
uh, needs of the association, a uh, lot of data evaluation. Um, I've gotten them kind of into and pretty much thrown them into alternative payment methodology because um, he's a, a really smart young man and I need uh, another person to bounce stuff off of. Of course, I'm the CEO. And then Betsy um, is a consultant here at MAC. Um, we're a bi-state PCA. So um, she is in Delaware and has had several years of experience working with the health centers, probably around 15 or so. She used to be with the health department for many years and um, just really understands the politics in, in Delaware and understands health space. She's also written our, um, since I've been at the association for the last seven, almost eight years now, she's written our past two applications uh, with me um, for our competitive applications here at the PCA. Um, hearing my co family. my condolences, yes. <laughs> having having been part of many of those. <laughs> I was trying to leave, really. I really was. Um, so I was <laughs> for um, last year. I was the CFO and COO for the last seven years. Last year I was the interim um, CEO and CFO COO. And then um, I was crazy enough to put my hat in the ring to be the CEO, and now I'm the CEO for like you know two years or so. Before I leave. Um, so, thinking about this, I'm going to keep this, uh, the, even the recording, just internally with our team so we can talk really honestly and openly with you guys um, about some of our struggles as a PTA, um, given that we have a network. We actually have two networks. We have one in Maryland and one in Delaware. Um, who are, I'll talk about our Maryland network just really quickly. Um, that Maryland network has its chip, and it's been around for a while. Um, prior to me becoming the interim, they kind of served as a quasi-PCA to many of the members. Um, we've never had full membership within our state in Maryland of the health centers as part of the association until now, until last year. Um, and so needless to say that dynamic has changed greatly. Uh, with CHIP um, for the better, um, but uh, they used to do a lot of the IT component for many of the health centers. That um, is not really going to be a space that they can play with much longer. Many of the health centers have left. There's about eight members that they have. We have 16 health centers in Maryland and another three in Delaware. Um, all but one of the health centers in Delaware is part of our association. On the Delaware side, there's Delaware Health Net, and the two members of our association that are health centers in Delaware founded um, that network, um, and they tend to get a lot of data and a lot of value from the network. We don't have uh, really any type of robust information technology kind of data warehouse which is something we um, are desperately thinking about doing here at the PCA so that we could even start talking about IPA development um, because they do not share data well. They, they didn't share anything well. I just want to let you know <laughs> on the Maryland side. Um, they just didn't really care for each other um, that much, actually. Um, a lot of trust issues with the health centers. They are much okay. further along. Now, uh, we've done a lot of trust building, and it's not just, you know, Dwayne doing that. Our team has done that, and a great kudos goes out to Sally and Alborn um, at the, our sister organization, that CHIP, at the network. She and I really did a lot of work to make um, us look more unified, so then they kind of mimicked in turn and looked more unified. Trust is still not there. I don't think that's ever going to be there, but collaboration and the commitment to uh, one industry voice is there. And so that's huge within itself. And now I'm going to shut up and let you all do your thing. So <laughs> with that backdrop, Andy, please take it away. You tell us all about IPA and everything else we don't know. Yeah, sure. Well, we're going to, uh, you know, Amanda mentioned we'd, we'd love if we can get into a discussion. And actually pretty quickly once we start moving through the slides, you'll notice that, um, that we will. We do want to do a little bit of stage setting um, kind of how we look at the world, how we encourage our clients to look at the world, um, which then, you know, 
really gets into how reform is impacting your members and um, why we think they're better served to kind of, you know, disarm themselves a little bit from that mentality that they, you know, like you said, don't care for each other. Um, because the the reality is is that reform offers them a lot, but only if they're kind of willing to um, to come together. And that's the section that we'll talk about in terms of kind of the value <clears throat> of organizing. <clears throat> Even though um, a lot of organizations approach us and say, you know, specifically IPA, and, and, and in a lot of cases, um, we do think that's the right model. Uh, we want you to understand we we don't come into this type of conversation or any future conversations we have with a preconceived notion, and that's why we're going to explore three different models that we're seeing health centers adopt um, so that, you know, as we get to know you and as we kind of dig through some of the data you do have, um, we can, you know, we can give you some confidence that if you did decide to um, develop one of these models and given the place you've articulated, even if you try to, to simply get your members thinking about moving ahead with one of these models, that they would be likely to be successful given the markets that you operate in. Um, and then we'll just kind of briefly talk about what we recommend for groups like yours if they want to kind of get on board with that, um, that discussion. Um, and it's a lot of things you've already mentioned. It's thinking about how we're going to share information and use information to our um, mutual benefit, but um, there's a bunch more to it, and, and we'll talk through that. Um, you can go ahead and, and keep us moving to the next slide. Yeah, I got the next slide up for you. Okay. Um, I think you kind of already get a sense for this, so, yep, we can just move, move ahead to uh, do you agree with this statement. So this is an exercise that, you know, I think when we get started with a group like yours, Wayne, particularly one that's got some challenges, to the idea of potentially working together, um, we, we really want them to start thinking about uh, just how they're currently positioned. I think there's a little too much confidence uh, generally expressed in health centers positioning. Um, and, and really, it starts right here. We, we think that when people talk about the political uh, you know, nature of the Affordable Care Act and just how hotly contested it is, we think health centers are frankly right in the middle of that. Um, and the reason is, is because, as we like to say, and, and, and we get pushed back when we talk to members, you know, in this way, but, you know, we tend to refer to health centers as kind of a premium price provider. That, that doesn't mean that the services aren't better um, or more comprehensive or, you know, frankly, have to be more comprehensive to serve the population. But, you know, they're perceived by their peers and by their, you know, their non-health center peers as, getting a premium rate. Um, and if you if you hit forward one more time, I mean, I think the, the crux of what we're trying to get them to understand is that if they don't believe in this second sentence, if they can't stand on a platform that they are saving the system money by their very existence, it's going to be hard for them to do anything alone or as a network um, because reform is about frankly, reducing the total health care burden. And if you're a premium price provider, meaning you get paid to do more than other providers in the marketplace, you're going to be exposed to some political challenge. I, I just want to ask you folks, I, I'm guessing this is a very real feeling that you have, and, and I want to kind of get a sense from you of how you think your members would react to this. Sure. So um, I think it's a very real statement. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So kind of insight-wise, I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, some of the boo-ha-ha that happened right before the holidays with the National Association of Medicaid Directors. Yep. So yeah. and, and you are, right? So you know about the National yep. Program. Send out. Yep. So our, our uh, Medicaid director, his name, in, in Maryland it is, his name is Chuck Milligan. Chuck has been part of the leadership at NAMD for years. So he was the president of the association for several years. He's been a Medicaid director probably for the last 15, 16 years, most of his career. Um, he was the uh, Medicaid director in New Mexico for several years and then has been the Medicaid director in Maryland for the last eight years. So um, it wasn't until this year um, when I kind of took over as the interim, one of the first things that I really wanted to do with him was start a dialogue around doing these all FQAC meetings. Um, yeah. So we do a quarterly meeting every quarter with all the health centers and the Medicaid department. 
the first meeting was extremely hostile. It basically was this slide. Hello. You're paid other people. Hey, Betsy, welcome. Thank you. Um, so it was basically you guys get paid more than other people, um, and that's a problem for us, and we want to reduce that. <laughs> and so, of course, everybody heard PPS is going away, and also that, Chuck, you don't understand what we do for that rate, right? So the classic CHC kind of responds, we do all these wonderful services, blah, 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 and our people are getting all this value, um, and then it's like, so I'll prove it. Give me some data. Let me know some numbers. And so, of course, it, of course, their response is, you have the data. You're the Medicaid. You get the claims, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, he gets same data. He doesn't get quality data. So, yeah. Yeah. right. The big distinction, right? So, the, the good news about the this last year and, and kind of working with Chuck, um, and we have a really good friend in Steve, who's the Medicaid director in Delaware, and Betsy, who just joined, is our Delaware liaison, is with Chuck, it was, yeah, I pretty much wrote the letter for them. <laughs> I don't believe that anymore, but at the time I did when I wrote it yeah. about six yeah. months ago, I'm better now, and I really want to do this partnership. And if you think, Dwayne, that this is going to damage that relationship in terms of partnership and will make me look like a behind, then I'm not going to support the letter, which is what he did. So he, he was able to backtrack, and NAMD, consequently, has retr retracted, obviously, they didn't send that version of the letter, but they are sending another version of a letter, and so we're trying to get a little bit of intel around that. Conversely, completely opposite uh, is Delaware's uh, Medicaid director, who was adamantly opposed to the letter, how dare they accuse the health center of not doing all that you guys do. You all should get more, not less, under PPS. Um, yeah of course, which is, is a great place to be. Needless to yep. say, um, our state in Maryland, we have put in a SIMS application um, for um, creating payment reform. And our governor, even though he's going to be leaving at the end of this it's the election year, so our governor is leaving, our secretary of health that I've known forever is leaving, and Chuck just told me last week that he's also leaving um, – not and before the election actually happens, he's going to be moved back to New Mexico. So, regardless of what our health centers believe, which is they believe that half of them believe and understand that payment reform is real, and that PPS is going to change or modify and possibly go away. Okay. The other half are very entrenched in the idea that. PPS is a God-given right that the Lord wants us to have this money. How dare you devil people try to upset. We were going to, you know, get some holy water and spray you. Um, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a good place for half of the group. Now, I will tell you uh, that the group, all of the health centers came together last year, and they created a white paper, and this is all during the transition when I first got them board at the interim and one of my big tasks. I was like, well, that's what they talk about alternative payment methodology. What do you guys think? And so um, uh, we have a, a guy that's really great, Jay Wawalski, who's been kind of, I, I call him kind of the grandfather in this group. Um, they're all pretty old child, but um, he's the grandfather nonetheless, probably 70 something years old. Um, the rest of them are right behind that, around 60 something years old, except for two or three of them. Um, but they all listen to Jay, and Jay um, has been doing the circuit with our Medicaid director, Josh, I mean our Medicaid director, Chuck, and had done the circuit also with our Secretary of Health, Josh Sharpstein, kind of around health care reform. So he had already basically promised this white paper to Josh and Chuck and that he would get the health centers on board with this concept. The problem was, of course, the white paper was like a PPS plus, 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 plus paper. Mm -hmm. More money, give us more money, give us more money, and we're going to do PCMH, and we're going to have better outcomes, and we're going to blah, blah, blah. But PPS plus, plus was the, you know, PPS was our base, and then we're just going up from there. How the department received that internally, um, the folks told me, it was a completely joke. 
They're like, there goes the health center just asking for more money, which when you yeah. read it, had some really good principles in it, but it was so buried in pay me more mantra that overwrought it throughout the paper. So needless to say that, that the the movers and shakers within the group, which is probably six of them, really understand this and were part of doing this with you is to hear how you present this so that eventually after our strategic planning session in February that I convince them that we need to talk about this more <laughs> in our strategic plan to bring you guys back to help them get comfortable with the difference. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. does. And, and, and it's okay. interesting because Andy and I were just with another group last week and we were talking after that about um, as much as we think that – you know, the nomenclature about total medical expense has been floated out there, you know, particularly when you talk about, you know, the, you know, ACO models and the triple aim. Sometimes I, I'm still struck with a disconnect for, from the health center's perspective between their total revenues and what total medical expense is. Yeah. Because, you know, they get very, they get very sort of myopically focused on sort of my base payment, you know, plus some quality, um, you know, addition, you know, additional quality payments and things like that. And, you know, we try to, and I think Andy does a good job of this, of sort of talking to them about what is value-based payments and what are value-based payments and why isn't essentially the way TPS is structured now a non-risk adjusted, you know, encounter-based payment, why is that not a value-based payment, and what does that mean when you look at it relative to how things are trending, both within the safety net and outside the safety net. And, um, it, you know, so to some degree we try to be, I think, agnostic in sharing kind of how how, how our health systems and providers within those systems being compensated under this new model of reform and, you know, without the sort of cover, cover of, um, of, you know, the sort of safety net PPS umbrella of safety or whatever, you know. Um, Andy, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, I think it, it, I mean, your, your answers are, are helpful and I think it, you know, it kind of tees up all the right kinds of conversations because, you know, we're going to talk about essentially the need to put your money where your mouth is and prove it if you yeah. want to keep PPS. And, and that's, a net, that's a perfectly viable network function. Use your leverage to get the data you don't have from the state and actually make that case. Um, and yeah. it's also going to, going to kind of tee up why we think that even though the conversation may initially be a IPA, why why the ACO model needs to be in the discussion because the ACO model is right now a health center's best bet to get PPS plus of any of the current payment options. Um, you know, you don't have to negotiate it. You can kind of enter into it, and it's exactly that. It's you keep your PPS and you can earn more and go through the learning exercise of what it takes to demonstrate that you should be paid more. So really yeah, helpful to hear and, and, and definitely kind of would kick off the conversation well. Good. The only only the other thing that I, I want to just tell you guys is I think a large part of why we have the six or so having a different mentality than the rest of the group is mm-hmm. that for the majority of them, they have started at a health center and have only worked at a health center. So, right. for example, Jay came to Baltimore uh, after his uh, his master's in social work like in 1972, and started BMS, okay? And that was it. So his his worldview is a little myopic. Um, we have like two or three health center directors now that come from the hospital side, managed care side, um, other business industries that have nothing to do with health care whatsoever. So mm-hmm. their worldview is they've never heard of health centers until now. They're like, so y'all exist, really? So what do you do? I mean, like, and, and so yeah. it's a completely different discussion of how large the world is, and they've been really forcing the others to really look up 
And they say, okay, you, if you want to play, because you think you've been play, a player, honey, you haven't been a player, but you've been as a, 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 you know, a wart on the behind of an elephant. That is just not a player. It's just not really the world. So now we're trying to have a more world view, and I think that's a really good place, and I'm, I'm very excited about what you guys are going to be sharing next to help us, help them see that where we've been talking a little bit about is really real and that they could actually get a better deal if they look up and look and try to be part of a larger group. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's, yeah, that's and where we are. Yeah, in a minute. I was just going to say, you know, another thing that sometimes we'll spend some time talking with the health centers about and also at the PTA level is probably something that you're hitting on with the old guard that are coming up against, you know, this changing environment is what's going on with what's the conflict or the pressure point with your mission since you've been a mission-driven organization for 45 years? Yeah. How How is your mission being challenged in it? Because I feel like sometimes letting them talk for the millionth time, and I say this respectfully, about how important their mission is kind of yeah. gets it out of the way but helps yeah. contextualize it a little bit differently Beyond just saying no money, no mission, which you hear all the time, but like actually saying, you know, what does this really mean about how you interact with the poor? How does this mean, you know, what does this mean in terms of, you know, what, how is your mission changing in the face of all of this and why is this so uncomfortable? Because that is part of it too, you know? Um, it's, it's out of the comfort zone. Go ahead. Correct. Right. Right. All right, guys. So I'm, I'm, I'm shut up. Please go. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Well, this, this next slide is actually intended, and, and I'll tell you the answer because I've, I've done the calculation, but this next slide is kind of intended to get them out of their comfort zone with a, with a much more positive message. And, and when we do this with a membership, we actually bring with us um, quite a bit more detail about how we run these calculations and how, you know, we think they should be using them. But the whole idea is, and, you know, your members, as of the most recent UDS reports, I could get access to, and I say your members not knowing which ones are and are not actually yeah. PCA members, but, the, you know, the, according to the UDS report, uh, health centers in Maryland and Delaware combined care for about 320,000 patients, and that's a couple of years old. Yeah. And, you know, according to, um, you know, according to, uh, I use Kaiser uh, State Health Facts, which is a, just a good resource for cost. You know, with an average expenditure of somewhere around $6,000 blended for the Medicaid population and realizing that many of the patients are, are uninsured but probably look from a cost standpoint more like a Medicaid population, you're yeah. talking about a membership that essentially manages about a $2 billion annual health care budget. Yeah, that's and really, really cool. That's a great way to start off the conversation. It's very positive. Well, I don't think many of them come to the table as the board of directors of a $2 billion enterprise. That's not how they view themselves. In fact, some of them are almost put off by um, that fact. But it's hard to get away from it. When you look at that scale, and I didn't, I didn't do it for you folks, but when we do this with the members, we actually benchmark that to other health systems that operate in their markets. So uh -huh. it gives them a just a relative sense, and then we ask them questions like, you know, how many data analysts do you think Johns Hopkins has, and what do you think they're doing with EHR data, and uh, suddenly they start realizing that there's essentially a, a, a missing infrastructure, not just the technology, not just the bricks and mortar, but a missing infrastructure to care for this, this population that really can only exist if they work together. We're never going to have a thousand data analysts like Partners Healthcare in Boston, but we sure as heck should have more than we probably have today. And if everybody had to go out and build that, there's just no way we could kind of keep pace with our, you know, with our peers. And uh, that's kind of eye-opening for them. And they don't quite understand the total medical expense. Actually, Amanda and I had a conversation today about building some additional content to really help them understand that. Um, but that's how they're valued. They're valued based on whether or not they can bring that $2 billion number in over or under budget, uh, and they're only going to do it if they – they're only going to be able to prove it if they work together um, effectively. Does that all make sense? 
That totally makes sense. Make them think about themselves as the industry, which is really the point, which is great. That's right. That's right. All right. Let's keep right. rolling, please. So I think you saw this next slide, slide seven, when we were in um, – uh, maybe not this one. I, I don't think we, we don't need to belabor this one. We know it's moving from volume to value. Um, yeah. The thing that I did do here, and, and we've used this a couple different times, but we've started to color code it to say, are health centers in good shape or bad shape as this kind of particular change is rolled out? Um, and the two that we think are probably the scariest are um, working with data besides EHR data, so specifically cost and long-term outcomes data, um, because let's be honest, we, we may know how a diabetic is is managed, but we don't often know if they end up in the hospital. We don't often know if they end up having significant surgical procedures or um, other complications. And um, essentially, the, the ability to roll out in a lar at a large scale evidence-based care. Uh, health centers yeah. are, frankly, struggling with how to make operational and workflow and clinical changes around the small number of UES measures. And around us, we're seeing health systems that can essentially adopt new drug formularies and new treatment options very, very quickly. They can say, this is how we're going to treat this particular disease state. And as a result of that standardization, can start to do things like predict costs. Uh, so those are two areas we think they're in, um, you know, kind of particularly tenuous water, um, but there's more good than bad. There's actually more reasons why we think they're well positioned than we think they're poorly positioned. And if we did this for private physicians, particularly in small practice, forget it. It would be largely red. Right. So, right. Amanda, do you right. want to add anything here? Um, I don't think so. I, I guess the only thing just from a process perspective um, for your guys' benefit is that we realize that, you know, the red, yellow, and green may vary, you know, from market to market and from health center to health center. So one of the things as we go through a data gathering phase with the membership is they'll actually have opportunities to reflect and talk about these and other sort of, you know, post-reform realities that are most relevant to them. So, for example, if they don't feel like, you know, they're in a strong position, um, or maybe well positioned for, you know, payment for value, you know, we'll have an opportunity to talk about that with them on a more individual level. But what we're trying to do here is just sort of exactly to what Andy said, to say when we look at health centers on balance, this is what we're seeing, you know, sort of trending nationally. I like it a lot. I think uh, okay. the slide is really simple, but it's very, very powerful. I also think it builds off of the, again, the need for data, um, and they also need to understand how they fit in a larger schematic of health system cost. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. not, I mean, the, really, literally, our Medicaid, I mean, we've had three discussions lately. One has been around 340B, uh, and it's Medicaid that asked us about this, you know, a survey. And they basically said, hey, we're looking at, um, the 340B program and want you to fill out this survey. And the survey seems innocent enough, but it's not really. <laughs> it's asking them, so what do you do? What would you do if you didn't have this money? Right. Who are you contracted? <laughs> how, how, how much is, you know, your, your, your dispensing fee versus the actual billing to right. fill the script if you have a pharmacist on hand? I mean, it's, it's really getting to, and they're basically suggesting, hey, other states are doing stuff different, right? Mm -hmm. And we want to basically reduce your the money, money you're getting right now, 440 p. So, again, right. it goes back to the cost sharing it and, and just basically transformation in the terms of payment reform in general. That's right. And if, right. Go, if, if we don't understand this well... We will have a lot of health centers that are going to that are go bye bye. They're going to close. Exactly. And right. yeah. and the next one. Why don't you go ahead? I I I'm pretty sure this was the one I saw. You can just open it all up. But you know yeah. this is the one that that we really try to use. And 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 this comes 
and I always joke about it, this comes from a long history of having people not in the business ask us what we do. And, of course, their next question is, what is your opinion on reform? And, and we try to be bipartisan on that, even though we obviously are strong supporters uh, of what the Affordable Care Act is doing and, and attempting to do. But what – this is, again, this is, an, this is meant to be kind of an uncomfortable conversation to say if these things in the green box that kind of look like PPS are going to get moved into insurance pools to essentially fund the, the whole thing, the whole shebang, then right. we better be good at figuring out ways to get that money back through new mechanisms. And yep. the three or the three types of organizations that we better and 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 for the P, we'll stop. I want to stop and talk a little bit about the PCA. PCAs in general have been very good at making relationships and working closely with and advocating to the state. But reform takes the state a little bit out of the picture and says. It's much more likely this money is being passed off to a different decision maker. So our advocacy ultimately has to change, not that we have to completely move away from advocating to the state, who still is a very important payer in all of this. But we better have skills and tools and resources for dealing with traditional managed care like private health insurance companies that manage Medicaid or the insurance marketplace plans or um, – provider organized managed care, which is a fancy way of essentially saying ACO-type organizations. And that's why these three topics become such hot topics and ones that we kind of get, you know, kind of often asked to come in and discuss. Now, in in your market and in the world you folks live in, you've got one state that I would guess is saying, um, you know, this is probably, you know, a social program and you know, and the like, and another state that's probably saying this is good business or this is, you know, this is what we should be doing. But at the end of the day, both states are going to get pretty significant pressure to move patients and move financial resources kind of in this direction. So it takes a little bit of the politics out of it and yet still helps them understand that this is a very real force um, that even if they don't end up creating something, even if they don't believe that they should be working together, they can't ignore that it's essentially pushing on health centers and other parts of the healthcare system to organize to address this fundamental shift in what's going on. Yeah. I really like it. I love the slide. I okay. think it's very powerful. I think our membership will view it and say, yep, mm-hmm, this is exactly what, what has to happen, even yeah. if yeah. The, the, uh, the details are going to be real sketchy in terms of I mean, when I tell you they're very, um, they just they have not had a good experience playing with each other in terms of, like, data. So, um, it is just what it is. I mean, our network for years had a, a really good, what, what Sally was very good at helping them do was uh, negotiate a good uh, EMR price for the G-Centricity yeah. product. Okay, uh, okay. The problem was um, she kind of unfortunately embedded herself between herself and GE and the health centers. Yeah. So if the health yeah. centers want data or any changes in their in their EMR, they had to go through her to get the change, who had to then go to GE. So the process by which that change occurred and the sharing of data really never happened. Gotcha. Doesn't like she was able to then take all their data and then run reports collectively on the group, which one would think that you would be able to do if everybody's on the same platform. But for whatever reason, more distrust, I'm sure they said, oh, hell no. You will not be running any reports that do that, but you will be yeah. doing it. You can help manage our data. And then they were like, okay, none of this is making any sense. So. That's where they are now. So th- this this okay. is a great great illustration again of your point. So I ain't gonna say that now. So. Well, the um, you know I mentioned certainly my career, but Amanda's as well has kind of meandered through 
um, you know, a variety of different aspects of what they're going through and doing. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we were doing data way back when, and, and, and we like to say the biggest, the biggest opportunity that our health center industry missed was settling on a single EHR and implementing it consistently within geographic areas. And, yeah. and that's one that we essentially can now quant- – I mean, we can point to the work people are doing to either rip out and re-implement or um, put kind of middleware products in place to normalize data um, to, to, you know. And, and the I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to say that's – EHR and ability to contribute data is actually, in my opinion, one of the biggest threats to independent practices right now because mm-hmm. the health systems the health systems are going to put so much pressure on them anyway to join up with them but one of the areas they're they're going to be, they're going to basically come in and say you're going to use our product or you're not uh, or you're not yep. going to be affiliated with us and if you're not affiliated with us you're not going to get patients so it's out there you know and it's very real you know uh, Dwayne, we we took out we we have a discuss, uh, kind of a discussion point slide um, that we usually use with the members but one of the things that would be really valuable for us is if we can do, um, before we dive into this kind of PPS modeling that, that we'll talk about, can we just do the, a quick recap of expansion activities and managed care activities in both states? Sure. So that we have a general sense of where things are? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we'll start uh, with Maryland first. So. Um, okay. Maryland, uh, you, you may know, is was the first state to kind of get things going, and we have a state-based exchange, um, yeah. or, which is great uh, to some degree outside of the problems on the website. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we have problems just like the federal website. Um, so the biggest challenge to them has been two big things. One is that we were not able to um, – we, our state, because they were ahead, which is awesome, but because they were ahead, they were behind. So the federal federal government, when they came out with the CAC program and said, hey, we want to do this CAC thing and want you guys to do X, Y, and Z, that caused a lot of additional problems. Um, essentially what ended up happening was we had two groups. We had um, these things, these calls connector entities, and there were six entities that got um, state funding to be these connector entities that divided the state into six. Those six entities then were going to have these personnel that they were trained to be the sisters, right, the, the patient navigators, navigators and assisters. So those were going to be the two groups that were basically responsible for enrolling and doing outreach and getting people linked into care. So at, uh, at the very beginning of this, I, I, I we – as a PCA, we've informed everybody, hey, there are going to be these six entities. You all want us to be one of the six. They're like, no, no, no. We've already negotiated some contracts with these people. I was like, okay, great. As long as you all are connected, just make sure you stay connected. Yeah. Of course, the, the ones that are on top of it, we're connected. The ones that are a little slow on uptake, they were not connected. So um, they, the state did a five-day training for these patient navigators and assisters. Now, if you were if you were there and, like, got connected with the six entities, then you were fine. You got additional dollars to do outreach and enrollment. Then in July of this year, of course, the federal government came out and her and said, hey, we found some new money, and, hey, health centers, we're going to give you money, and all you have to do is do outreach and enrollment, but we need you to report back everything that you're doing. Of course, for, I'd say, 60 40 uh, percent of the group in Maryland, they weren't part of those connector entities. So they were able to do outreach, but they weren't trained by our state or certified by our state to do enrollment activities. So we've been trying with, desperately with the state to get this other 40 group to get trained in some kind of way, shape, or form. I was like, maybe we could have the patient navigators trained. We'll pay the state to train our people. We tried everything. They no, 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 we're developing the rules because it had to be legislated for this new group. Uh-huh, group. yeah. Yeah, had the certified application counselor. So mm-hmm. that didn't get legislated until November. 
So now, in February, next month, they will actually have the training, which, of course, I told you, the first training was five days in-person training. Right. This is going to be a three-hour webinar for people to get certified. It's right. ridiculous. So yeah. we've had a lot of activity that's been good um, in terms of expansion, in terms of managed care contracting. Uh, pretty much all the managed care entities, they basically rolled off over whatever they had already with an existing health center and just said, we're not going to change anything. If we're paying you $12.50, that's what we're going to pay you, yep. you know, underneath this new model, blah, blah, blah. That's going to be good for about a year. Next year, I will imagine once they figure out, okay, this is we're losing money as a managed care entity, they're going to go back and renegotiate contracts. So we've done two – uh, actually, we've done three trainings on managed care contracts. Uh, we brought a um, um, uh, young, wonderful young lady over at NAC who does a great job. She's over there managed care contracting. Um, she's been wonderful and invaluable. She's done two trainings for us. And then we did two additional trainings in partnership with our network here in uh, Maryland. And Delaware, um, Delaware is a federal partnership, um, but it is really operating more like a state-based exchange. Um, they've made a lot of progress. So the two key things there is one of our health centers that's not our sister health center, and Betsy, please add on if you, if you think any differently here, um, who's not a member of our association. And now everybody in Maryland is, and there's only three health centers in Delaware. So yep. the one that is not is, is Westside. Um, Westside actually got the contract to do education. The state figured out that people don't play well pretty much with West Side, and so they've expanded the contract, mm-hmm. and now Boza and, and Brian, our other two health centers, have gotten training, and they've been trained, and everybody's trained, and they're getting direct dollars from the state. So it's really going very well in terms of outreach and enrollment in uh, Delaware. They, are, just like us, are having glitches in terms of, um, <clears throat> in terms of the, the uh, website portal um, the good news that's different from our state in, in, in Maryland versus Delaware is Delaware was able to negotiate and put in legislation. They are guaranteed their PPS rate with any body underneath the exchange. So the managed care entities have to honor that rate. That, of course, is not here in Maryland. They've had right. some challenges with that, um, but they're still getting it to, to the best of my knowledge right now. Betsy, is there anything different from your perspective? No, I think that's all correct. The, the only thing that uh, minor clarification is that uh, the state, when they competitively or they put out a competitive bid for uh, the outreach and enrollment assistance, and the, the non-member FQHC was one of several vendors that um, bid, um, but. Um, but but yeah, I mean, like like Dwayne said, everything's going well. The the two member FQHCs do have some federal dollars for on-site outreach and enrollment through HRSA, and mm-hmm. uh, and, and um, you know everything seems to be going fairly well. I mean, in terms of broad phenomena, and this is just um, just a footnote. Um, the the predominant workflow impact is around. Uh, getting Medicaid re-enrollment accomplished because they're running through the exchange. It's been it's it, there's been more pickup around Medicaid re-enrollment than there has been net new enrollees coming in on an exchange product. Yeah, and that's what we're seeing. That's what's trending nationally, I think, as well. What I'm sorry in this, I totally apologize for not knowing the answer to this. But Dwayne, can you remind me? Um, where um, were, were you guys full expansion up to 139 in both states? And then yeah. how do you guys have a sense of how much of a proportion of your existing health center patient population was shifting? Like how much of an impact it was having on the uninsured, the current, the previous uninsured? Yeah. So in in uh, Delaware, not as much as you would think. Um, they were pretty penetrating, um, and Delaware, unlike us, had expanded to 138% of poverty level back in the day, um, several years ago. Ours was at 118, so that was a huge increase 
to go up to 138 um, Maryland. So there was a big impact in Maryland um, on uh, those new those new uninsured individuals that were on other types of subsidy programs, but weren't definitely weren't getting. You know, they weren't they were our members, but we weren't getting any money for them. Right. So uh, it's a little over 400,000 people, 40,000, sorry, 40,000 people. We do have a, a few slides that we've put together um, explaining both Maryland and Delaware, because we do, we do, uh, we created a transformational call at the very beginning of this, and we've worked with both, all the health centers. So we have an outreach and enrollment call, which is a transformation call. We've done advertisements for them. We're in the process now of doing radio ads. We've done marketing materials. Um, we've gone out and done lots of presentations of what the impact of ACA is going to mean for your health center. And Jeanette has been great at doing analysis for the Medicaid and then looking at different levels of the poverty level to say this is what we anticipate in this A range, this is what we anticipate, and this is how you're going to change your pyramid. We also did a whole series uh, where we create them um, two financial models. Um, we had a guy that financial and modeling. And so it could change your paramedics, change your volume, and let you know where, the, you know, really what your bottom line is going to look like. <laughs> Either way, the more you change. Um, and, and then that's been really helpful, and that we do within the CFO work group. Okay, great. And, and have they been responsive? Because that's really, I mean, we do a lot of the sort of similar, you know, iterative um, number crunching for them so they can see that. And I think it's really helpful for us to know, you know, how to use what they've already seen and anything we might present. But how, were they, were they, um, did they positively respond to the projections? Because I know sometimes we get a little pushback um, about, um, you know, how realistic some of the projections were, you know, the whole nobody's ever yeah. going to want to see my patient okay. thing, you know, that kind of thing. So, again, with the CFOs, great feedback. CEOs, not so much. So um, the CFOs, you know, they're, they're the number people. So they're like, yeah, that's a real number, man. What the, what the hell? Uh, <laughs> it is what it is. CEOs, on the contrast, they're, they're always are looking for, ah, I don't think it's that bad. Ah, I think the market share is better. Ah, I think blah, blah, blah. Regardless of whatever number you put up in front of them, um, they don't believe that that number is the real number. Um, What's been very helpful is that we've been doing kind of group level training, which has been really good around fiscal stuff, where we bring in the finance person, generally the comptroller. We try to bring in like um, either the COO or the CMO and then the CEO. And then it's not us verifying the numbers, telling the number to the CEO as much as the group is like, yeah, that actually sounds pretty right. Mm -hmm. And then the CEO gets the, okay, my team believes I mean, that must be actual. I mean, I think that's that's great that you've done that legwork. I was just sharing, you know, some experience we had with a, with a previous group when we were on site with a client last week about, I think Andy spent, I mean, no fewer than, you know, 15 to 20 hours talking about, you know, the return on investment of a projection of a $1 increase in PMPM under a new contract. Yeah. So the fact that your folks have have seen and experienced and touched these kinds of calculations before makes the discussion a, sort of the imperative of working together. I think it, it, it makes our job a little easier in that sense. Because I, so I hope so. I, again, you know, our group is really good. They're really good when the other people are in the room. They're not so good when they're not there. When they don't have their okay. finance in there, they get real close to the uh, chest, if you will, in terms of talking about numbers at all. Um, now, I, I mean, I, I can see their PBS rate. I'm like, look, dude, it's just you and I. I know what your PPS is, and it's different. And that is probably the, the largest driving um, fear, if you will, to this group, particularly Maryland, not Delaware. Delaware, happy, go lucky, beautiful people outside of, you know, the one person there that's a little crazy. But 
our group of 16 over here in Maryland, good and crazy. Good and crazy people who have sued each other. <laughs> Several oh my times, God. not once or twice, no, we're talking several times, have sued the state probably on a constant basis for the last eight years. We're talking at least 24 lawsuits. Name oh, the man directly in the lawsuit, and they don't know why the man won't return your call? Really? Right. right. Come on. So right. that their, their fear is, and it is true, in, De- in Baltimore City, we have eight health centers in Baltimore. The PPS, the range, the range is a good $150 difference from the top range to the lowest range. Wow. That's significant. Yeah. But we have one health center that started out doing nothing but HIV clients. Hmm. So the other health centers didn't start right. off doing that. So, you know... They were operating on that PPS from way back in the day when nobody would touch an HIV patient to now all the health centers have HIV programs. They are getting more reimbursement because of that. It's just different. So right. I, I just gave you a, that as a backdrop because that's part of what influences them in here. Now, mind you, the one that's getting paid pretty doggone significantly more than others knows that that margin will, he comes from another world. He comes from, he did international global health for years. This is like, you know, retirement next step thing for him. So he's get, he's like, yeah, yeah, that, that rate that we have, that ain't going to happen, child. That's not going to be real. It's going to go away. We've got to figure out something else. So right. that, I hope, I hope it helps. That does help, absolutely. I love this, this slide, the payment pressure. Volume. I, I love this slide. I think I think it's going to go over well, particularly if you have, you know, uh, real. We we do some work together to give you some real good numbers um, yeah. when you're doing your analysis. That is giving them information that they know is real. Well, I, I don't think we need to belabor it. I think you 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 pretty much articulated that you guys have already done some of this work, but. You know, we're finding that people are spending so much time being worried about PPS rate and not realizing that what reform really presents them with is an opportunity to move patients off of their really low slide rates uh, and into fee schedules and, and, and for the time being, and we don't want to in any way give them false confidence of this, but for the time being without taking away things like grants or PPS on the Medicaid population. And if you just yeah. keep moving forward, you know, basically – what we say is that, that gives you a small window of time on slide 10 to kind of, you know, think through what might be the strategies for closing any gaps should we ultimately find that, um, you know, that, that the FQHC rate, the PPS rate, or grants, which we expect to go down, um, ultimately go down. So, you know, a lot of this is tee up. A lot of this is stuff that I think you guys are very well ingrained in, but we would feel remiss if we didn't kind of help them figure out that by the time we get to how do you get to value-based contracting and value-based payments, that there's kind of a real emergent need to look at doing so over the next few years. Yep. So, um, Andy, and I, think, and I think the other point that Andy always makes on this is the importance of being able to – truly drill down and look at what your collection rates are. Mm-hmm. Um, and he makes that point, you know, pretty well on, you know, slide 10 where you look at, you know, just the gain from better collections. Yeah. Um, and and how important their effectiveness is in that, you know, and the role that that can play in future negotiations with payers if they're not pulling down everything that they could be. Yeah. Um, and the disadvantage, you know, that they put themselves at by not implementing appropriate um, processes and strategies for maximizing collections. And that love, becomes important I, later on. Yeah. This is, this is exactly what they need. And, I, again, I think if we could make sure queuing it up a little bit with the CFO work group, and talking yep. them about numbers a little bit before we present to the larger group, I think that's really going to really, really help sell this point. Um, all the CFOs are all talking about collections. They're all worried right now about ICD-10. 
implementation, they're, they're forever complaining about, you know, well, what, what, what's my, I mean, we've been doing an analysis with Mike Holton now for some time. We did a cost-based analysis over the summer, and we're about to do another kind of second round of that. But, like, what is your true cost? And that was difficult because nobody could answer the dang on question. I'm like, y'all get it. You're killing me. You are killing me. How don't you know your cost? How is that possible? Right. They, they haven't had to. Well, they yeah, but they haven't had to, Dwayne. I mean, it's oh, they've been living, you know. Right outside of the you know the Medicare cost report. You know, right, right, right. But, but you know, I just, I just, it, it, it's just, it's fiscally not responsible to not be able to do this analysis thoroughly for your health right. center. It's not a good thing. Which is why the CFOs really just. They love all this stuff. They they want to do a better job, and they want to make sure that they've done the very best job by looking at all the factors and everything that can that can happen. Some of this discussion around IPA is extremely taboo with this group. Others totally embrace it. All know that some kind of payment reform has to happen. The IPA is only taboo because of some people have tried to form an IPA um, in the past, and that didn't go too well. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good to know too. Because, yeah. You know. And and one of the things for us to think about, you know, just again in terms of process is if you know if and when we decide to move forward with more structured discovery process, you know, one of the things that we we talk about is um, you know the role of kind of a working group in helping to tee up the activities and. Um, you know, the framing of the discussion with the broader membership. And it sounds like that would be a real opportunity to pull a couple of your CFOs in if their CEOs will allow them to represent them in their stead, which is sometimes not always possible, you know, depending on the personalities and egos involved. But um, we've also, you know, having that CFO perspective on that working group can oftentimes be, you know, helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And, then, you know, I... Again, I think that what one of the things that I'm seeing much more of lately, and this is real recent, only in the last, like, I'd say three, four months, the CEOs have really been releasing. They're like, oh, so wait, don't talk to me no more. I got it. So you want to do something with 340B, just talk to this person. Or I got it. You want to talk about PCMA, don't, I don't, I've left it. I've told them whatever you people need, let them do that. And, I, and, you know, just see, see me on stuff when you need me, which is really, really a different place than they were. They're just starting to trust our organization again, which is really wonderful. But this is great. Great information, guys. So so let's move quickly through 11. I think you guys are definitely, you know, tuned in to what value-based payments are. Um, we will spend, if you go ahead to 12, I do want to spend a little time talking about the different types um, and, and, again, this kind of dovetails with that, you know, we, we want TPS plus. Well, uh, you know, the only way you're going to get anything more than TPS is certainly if you can do, you know, demonstrate that you do some of these things. Uh, hit quality incentives, uh, generate, you know, savings against the total premium or total medical expense, um, or start to take on, because those first two can be done without downside risk. The last two really are down. I mean, they're, they're just by their nature, they have downside risk. Bundled payments, um, you know, so looking at episodes of care and then taking a capitated payment for certain episodes or um, kind of more full capitation type models. So, uh, you know, these are, this is it right now. I mean, I, you can show me things that are, you know, funky and, and, and more complex and, and newer aged, but at the end of the day, they would kind of fit into one of these buckets. Um, and on the next slide, all we do is simply say that these kind of stratify from kind of lowest risk, lowest reward to highest risk, highest reward. But on the far left, on the far end of the spectrum is a cost-based system. Cost-based is, is about as no risk as, as you could possibly get um, because, you know, and we know that, you know, you hit caps and, and things like that, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, the goal of a cost-based system is to keep the price on and, and frankly, Nothing more. I mean, that's that's really what it was designed to do. Um, so, again, part of the rationale and part of the reason why we think health centers have to be thinking um, about getting into these kind of more advanced models. Um, 
we're going to wrap up this section and and we'll keep moving because I you know I know that we want to. We want to try to get through as much as we can. And if we have to do this again, you know, if we have to kind of wrap up at a later point, we will. But um, just so you know, I, I think this is hopefully helpful, actually, to kind of address with you folks now. Uh, ultimately, the state has a huge impact on which of the models we're going to talk about makes the most sense. Um, the the reality is, is that the, um, you know, in states where Medicaid is expanding, to a, you know, and it's a significant expansion and managed care is in play, IPAs really rise to the surface. Um, in states where they look to do direct contracting with providers, we think the ACO model is something that needs to be, you know, taken very seriously. So we don't want to make, you know, like we said, we don't want to make snap judgments and recommend something until we really understand those dynamics. And getting to know you folks and working with you is going to help us. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, we, we challenge anyone to say, that they're not going to have to manage more commercial style payments or commercial style contracts than they have in the past. Um, you mentioned your experience with Monica. There's a reason why Max brought her in, which is they know people are going through that pain um, of yeah. getting started with it now. And in some parts of the country, we're going from zero to 100% managed care. I mean, we're literally seeing health centers that have never built an insurance company before suddenly having it be 80, 90% of their business. Um, wow. I don't, well, yeah, I don't, and I don't suspect that's in the case in either of your states, but in some yeah. rural parts of the country, I mean, that's that's just the reality. Um, We've had Medicaid yeah. managed in both states for a very long time. That's what I what figured, is yeah. Thing is, um, in our in Maryland, CHIP is also um, their other hat is they have an uh, entity that's called Priority Partners, which is a managed care company where they have an ownership share, eight of the health centers, and they've partnered yeah. with Johns Hopkins in the past. That uh, managed care entity is going to go away in some kind of shape where form they might reformulate in something else. So some of them have, a, a, they will, <laughs> some of them believe that they have a great deal of managed care experience, let me just say that. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, whereas uh, uh, some of them just, you know, it, it is relatively new to them, and we have some new CEOs, you know, that I'm doing. A, I, I used to be in managed care for years. I was a director of um, contracting for years. Okay. Um, okay. Maybe. So, um, so I've been helping them out. But what is what's interesting? Um, and, and Sally just did a really good job. Unfortunately, because RPCA, I got to be honest, RPCA did not do some of the things that PCAs really should have been doing when my predecessor was here, um, and our membership, because they're just so dysfunctional, they didn't voice that at all. So they just got it from another place, or at least they thought they were getting it. And Sally Ann did a really good job of, of um, serving a need, if you will, uh, as a quasi-PCA, but she was only doing it um, with half of the health centers and not – with a good entire picture as a as an industry, so again, okay. you, you might have two or three that were really doing great, where you have eight others that really just don't know anything. So our our goal last year was just to try to bring everybody up to some reasonable comfort of basic managed care one on one. Got to two hundred one. That's as far as they are uh, right now. Okay. Okay. That's well, I can, you know, I can I can speak at length about the ways in which I think the the system is going to come under attack. It's, it's I think the last thing that's going to happen is just that the federal protection for it is going to go away. I think you're just going to see health centers opting out of it. So we'll move these three. We we will move through quickly. Um, okay. You you said it yourself. Federally qualified health centers largely misunderstood poorly communicated. I know the PCA does great work at the state level, but the average citizen doesn't know what they are. Um, and so you bring these new health insurance plans that are largely built on the backs of commercial insurers, and they are, you know, they want to know, tell me tell me why I should pay you differently. Um, yep. and, and it's that lack of hard evidence. I mean, we've kind of stood as an industry on a platform of 18-month-old national survey-type studies that tell us that theoretically health centers should uh, save the system a lot of money. 
And then we produce UDS data that shows as much variation as standardization in terms of how well we perform. <laughs> so, you know, it's like it, the reality is, is we need to be communicating this type of stuff on a monthly basis with our own data, not somebody else's data, um, you know, kind of being that platform. So go ahead. There's, there's only a couple of these, and then we'll, we'll talk about how we suggest measuring value. Um, sure. We've got a limited window. Uh, we're ahead of the market in terms of our patient-centeredness, um, in terms of our the fact that we even do quality reporting. Um, but, you know, honestly, this slide, Dwayne, is probably a year and a half old, and I don't know if I can say we've maintained that advantage. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's, that's concerning to me um, when I think about how much of an advantage it was. I mean, we really were super well-positioned. So, we try to get folks, and, and it's a little challenging for those that are less mathematically inclined, to think about um, essentially our value using this formula. And I can assure you that at some level this formula is used in every single insurance organization. The states are hiring analytics contractors that bring some version of this formula. We haven't plugged in all the variables, but quality and cost are inversely related. We know that if you have an unlimited amount of financial resources, you can reach a, a very different type of quality outcome. Commercially insured populations of patients with essentially all the money they need to be healthy, stay healthy, um, follow treatment plans, et cetera, will achieve higher quality scores. Um, that said, we know that we operate and serve a population in which the financial resources are extraordinarily limited. So we should expect, in theory, that our quality scores would be lower, and when they are not lower, that's a very good thing, um, because if we were properly able to risk adjust, we would actually be able to prove that not only were we doing as well as our private physician counterparts, but we might actually be doing way better than our private physician counterparts, and yet the data would never manifest itself as quality data. It, it would never show us as being 10 percentage points above on quality scores breaking even with a, with a fundamentally riskier population would, in essence, uh, mean doing better uh, if, we had a, if, we, if we were to normalize for that risk. And we throw scale in the mix, um, and sometimes we will, if people struggle with this, we'll refer to it as access. Um, I don't think they're quite the same thing, but at the end of the day, you could be the highest quality provider at the lowest cost, and you can manage the riskiest population, but if you can't take on one more patient, why should I even bother trying to contract with you because you don't have right. any room right. for my folks. Does that all make right. sense? Uh, totally makes sense. Okay. Um, and and as we kind of mature in our in our work with a client, we'll actually start applying numbers to these, you know, to these formulas. And that's really where we can where we can actually start to show them how they really benchmark um, from a value standpoint, and where to focus. And that's when, if you go to slide 24, that's where we start talking about the types of things that they need to do that really start suggesting some network-level activity. So they're color-coded because we've tried to align them with each of the five components of the formula. But on the left side, it's how well are you contracting today, and how well are you actually maximizing the value of your existing contracts? On the right side, the quality, are, are you benchmarking? And frankly, you know, it's great. I, I love hearing that health centers have finally started putting some of their own data up on, you know, a whiteboard or, or, or a, an overhead uh, LCD projector when they're in the same room and talk about comparative performance. they got to do that outside of the of the health center world, too, because, you know, they're, the people who are buying health care services are not just buying it from health centers. No, they're not. And, then when, and when we don't like what we see, we've mm -hmm. got to be able to kind of get closer to the problem and start embedding, you know, quality improvement is, not, is no longer a siloed function. It's got, it's got to essentially be the job. It's got to be at the point of care um, yeah. and, and be the job. Now, this, this nothing that brings good. Sorry, do we so we have spawn heads on the on the board. There's probably about three or four of them um, that really like numbers. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. They're going to really value this. 
Then we have, I said three or four, and we have 19 people. So yeah. We have a few yeah. others that not so much. The thing that they love to talk about is, oh, we have the, oh, the people are so, so sick. So they love focusing on this risk. <laughs> They love talking yeah. about, oh, but we see the poor of the poor of the poor people in Baltimore. Sure. Ours are poorer than your poor by 40%. Right. Yeah. Really? They're 40% yeah, poor. And, it, and it's <laughs> funny because we, Andy and I just had this conversation last week, too, um, you know, about really expanding out for the groups what is measuring risk really look like. Um, yeah. And we had a client say he felt that his members sort of felt that there was an implied or an inferred um, risk adjustment with PPS and that, uh-huh. you know, when you really ask the health centers how many of them have done any risk adjustments on their patient populations, uh I think Andy and I have talked to several hundred over the last year and a half, and the grand total of the health centers that have done that is zero. Right. And, you know, I think, you know, Andy, I wonder if it's not worth, when we think about, you know, a larger discussion with the group, you know, spending some more time thinking through some of the discussions we've been having around defining what risk is and how do you truly measure it and what is it relative to total medical expense because that's the only that's predominantly the environment that the payers are going to care about it, you know, relative to total medical expense. Yeah, so, I, I, I don't know. I mean, why in the discussion to force them to really talk about what does that mean for risk adjustment? So I, I love that if they're able to quantify, the more that you're forcing them to really think about how do you quantify that, not that you just say that, oh, they're poor, what does that mean? They get yeah. shot more. What, what are you talking about? So you're not doing gunshots, right? Not time I check. You're not pulling bullets out of people. Now, the ER down the street might be doing that from your health center, but you're not doing that. Um, so, so what does that mean? And in, in, in forcing them to kind of go through how do you explain this? Because if you're able to explain it, you'll be able to get that contract value. You'll, you'll be able to say, oh, we have a better value because we do this better. But you gotta get yeah. to again looking at your ICD uh, ten information and really being able to say, okay, this is you know we're coding appropriately. I mean, I don't know how many coding trainings we. I, I think we did four or five coding trainings this year, which is crazy. But yeah. came back to the same thing. Oh, there's ICD ten. Really? <laughs> Are you freaking me? Like, how long have we been by ICD ten? Like ten years now. They've been trying to move right. to ICD for at least three years, right? right? Right. But if you only have the coders in the room and not the CMO in the room and none of the physicians, well, then you're going to be talking to coders who are going to yeah. just go back and say to the physician, why aren't you coding appropriately? And then the physician is not even going to talk to the coder. Like, how dare you? Speak to me. You didn't go to medical school. You don't know, you don't know about my client. This is what right. they need. Blah, blah, blah. So... I, I can't I can't emphasize enough the more that we're able I think what you guys did with this formula is is it's just it's 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 so rich and so powerful. Um the other other piece is just being able to help them understand yeah, you might not see the change in the value now for the scale you're talking about, like leveraging yeah. PCA for enhanced access. You may not see it now because there's no dollar value attached to PCMH outside of your cooperative agreement says you better get PCMH certified by, you know, 2017, uh, outside of that. But you are going to be able to contract differently if you have this level. But you need to understand what it means because it's just not having the certification. Right. Right, right. exactly, exactly. It's what you do with that certification. How does it That's really right. decide in terms of quality? So, and, and this, Amanda and I will debate so we're blue in the face, the right number of patients that a single physician panel. <laughs> but at the yeah, end, so we, and, we have a lot of internal argument about that. Oh, don't worry. Well, every every health center has the same <laughs> argument. <laughs> that's right. Uh, CFO will always have another number that's nowhere near the CFO's <laughs> number. 
That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, this, this, this is all a lot of tee up. This, I think, is important to cover, and, and I don't know if, uh, mostly because this isn't a hard and fast rule, but it's certainly been my experience. Nobody cares about you unless you have 5,000 other patients. Um, right. And I sympathize with why. I, I absolutely understand why. It's It's a lot of work to do all those calculations on any of those types of payment models unless you've got 5,000. Now, I pulled up, excuse me, I pulled up your data not too long ago, earlier today, and looked, and you've got some health centers that would maybe, maybe have 5,000 patients with Medicaid, but if you're in a managed care environment, I don't think you would have any that would have 5,000 patients with a single Medicaid managed care provider. So, you know, if, if I were speaking to you as the health plan executive saying, okay, you want PPS and you want us to give you a shared savings opportunity, but you manage 600 of your pa- of our patients, there's there's just no way. They have no, they have absolutely no interest in doing that. And so right here, this says, look, either get together on this or get together with someone, you know, get together amongst yourselves or get together with someone else because you're not attractive enough to any of these payers to, to be worth the time, investment, and, and frankly, the, the risk because they, you know, they, they, it's statistically insignificant to do any of this type of work with you. And what we really, the position we'd really love to see health centers in is in having the ability to enter some of the more advanced models because they have the scale, they have the lives, but not necessarily being forced to enter those other models until they've mastered the techniques and the skills that are going to allow them to participate in in any of these models. So we want them thinking about, do we come, is is the simple reason to think about coming together that, you know, that guy from Boston told us that nobody's interested in us at 5,000 or less patients and and then figure out why, how do we come together, what are the services that we come together around, whether that's contracting or otherwise, but we have to kind of do this because we're just not independently big enough to, to you know, to be attractive to these these very important partners that we showed you on the slide where we said, State kind of becomes less important. The payers themselves have become very important under this model. Let's see. Where should we? Let's keep moving. Um, the next slide is is essentially, um, basically, when when we got all the way through analyzing some data, we said, okay, let's let's make it real for these folks. What does the market shift? market share shift look like? How does their payer mix shift? It sounds like you've done this, so we could, you know, we would be able to kind of immediately move to some of the work that you've done. Um, But, again, this was a market where fee-for-service Medicaid, as they knew it was essentially going away, it was becoming managed care. They had a significant, and I'm I'm not sure, you on, I'm still seeing slide 25, Dwayne. Are you guys on the next one? Hold on for one second. Okay. I was there, and I moved away from it for a second. Okay. Give me one sec. Yeah, we're here now. Yeah, there we go. All right, cool. So, you know, and this this is a couple of years out in terms of its projection because it has a very high um, benefits exchange attribution number. But, um, you know, it, it, what the story it basically says is fee-for-service goes away, Managed Medicaid is is everything to you folks in the sense that it's, you know, roughly five times bigger than any other population you deal with. And Managed Medicaid is going to be one of those forces that puts pressure on PPS, either because they're going to actively put pressure on PPS or because they're going to look to work around you at some level to avoid having to pay PPS. Uh, because ultimately we think that they're going to be the ones left holding the bag on utilization of health centers from a PPS standpoint. So um, your two states, it would be very interesting to do this across two states. We do have one other bi-state PCA, which is the one up in uh, New Hampshire and Vermont as clients. Um, yeah. Because we actually, you have to kind of do this at the state level, given mm-hmm. the complexity of reform. 
But yeah. elections aren't any different across state lines. Things are going to shift, and how they shift is going to have an impact on how you need to organize. Let's jump to 27, and then I'll take you through kind of two models that we see. Uh, basic core guiding principle. I said we don't come with preconceived notions, but given that scale factor and given the fact that I, I think when I ran, and I'm looking at it right now, when I ran the data, I saw two health, I'll just name them because, you know, we're we're talking, sure. frankly, three lower counties. Yep. And the one in Delaware, which I think you said was not even. West side. Uh, well. Henry had a job. Yeah, honestly, the three lower counties is actually the only one that that passes kind of that scale test where I could say they've got a shot at having 5,000 with a single payer. So, you know, where whereas you guys seem to have a decently high percentage of Medicaid versus uninsured, uh -huh. the scale is an issue. And, and they're going to have to think about coming together pretty significant, you know, with most of them at the table – to get that scale because there's really only one in the whole state that would actually kind of command much direct interest from payers otherwise in the two states. And it's so interesting that you say three lower counties because, so three lower counties, the reason why their number is a little higher is that Sue's, um, Sue, um, Susan, um, Sue Gray is, her, is the CEO, but they do, um, they, they have the both diverse. They're, they have the, a huge OBGYN practice, and so the number is so high um, because it's the only thing they're on the eastern shore. And there's nothing else remotely gotcha. near them at all. Okay. Uh, so, so everybody knows about them. They do a, a wonderful job of advertising as well, and they do a great job of partnering yeah, with people yeah, down yeah. there. So, okay. which unlike Baltimore City, um, where you would think that we would have so many lives or at least you would see somebody that has a higher managed care. But Baltimore City also is less income as well uh, as okay. you have more people. You have less income, so you have a, a higher Medicaid um, or uninsured population. Um, right. Only other right. place that we have where there's some higher income is Montgomery County, but the populations that they serve also are extremely uh, impoverished people. Um, a lot of immigrants. Um, yeah. Okay. So it it, the, 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 it it totally makes sense. It's not that their their people aren't there. They've just never gone after them before. Well, they've never had. Yeah. They've never, yeah. they've never yeah. done it. Yeah. So it is. Uh, well, but I love the 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 um, the notion of coming together because the larger ones, which are like the we have two really large health centers, Baltimore BMS and Chase Braxton. They think they can do IPAs right now, <laughs> huh. and that would not happen. Uh, the, the the BMS really believes that. Chase Braxton knows better. The CEO there knows better. He knows he's yeah. not a partner yeah. with other people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just interesting. All right. These, these next two, I, this is really meant for folks that kind of don't have an understanding of, of IPA. But this is essentially the horizontal network. Um, you know, ACO, uh, you can make an ACO horizontal, but really we're talking about IPAs. Organizations that fundamentally look the same and operate the same come together. Um, there's some stuff in the middle, some services in the middle. It doesn't have to be a lot. At a minimum, it's, it's contracting. Uh, and this is how they essentially generate their scale. They, the IPA organization, whether it's an LLC, whether it's a corporation, whether it's a not-for-profit, basically aggregates the lives under one roof. And because the organizations are complementary and look similarly, they are pretty effective at convincing the payers that they should have consistent contracts across the board. So not real rocket science, but depending on – you know, we, we've done a lot to tee this slide up, and, and part of it was that scale conversation, two health centers coming together, even if they could aggregate have 80,000 lives, probably isn't of interest, because when you break it down by only 40% or 30% Medicaid and then break that down by three to five payers, 
you're going to get right back to being below that 5,000 number. On the flip side, we know on slide 29 that, that the organizations do have to think about, um, you know, how they might participate in vertical networks. And, you know, this, this is the, this is the traditional, what people think of as the ACO, which is the health system kind of runs the show. The, mm -hmm. Um, they go out and they make relationships with all sorts of facility-based providers, and they include the FQHCs. But our fundamental concern in these models are, um, generally speaking, the FQHC is going to be looked at as the place where they dump risk. And, and risk dumping or, you know, creaming is sometimes the term you hear for taking the low-risk patients is always has a negative connotation. It always, we always make it sound bad. But some organizations, some FQHCs are embracing it, and they're saying that is our mission. But if we were to go back to the slide that had the 14 skills lined with the value equation, I would say before you do that, before you embrace that, don't just do that because it's your mission. Do it because you know you've got the right skills to properly negotiate appropriate distributions of things like shared savings or other alternate payment methodology options because organizations that embrace this for example, and I've got the note here, they'll put seven social workers around a single physician to deal with all the social determinants, to deal with all of the unmet behavioral health needs, and that's the only way they're making the model work. And so if they don't have something, and, and I can tell you, this, particular, this is an actual FQHC that I believe operates south of you folks um, in one of the Carolinas, but with seven seven licensed social workers, actually the slide should read opposite, it's seven licensed social workers to one MD, um, paying for that looks like a very bloated PPS, but in reality, this organization is saving its community within an ACO contract a ton of money because they're going to, they're walking into this practice to talk to their social worker instead of going to the emergency department for the same reason. So... Uh -huh. They can do it. They're not going to do it on their own. They're going to do it as part of a larger system. And if they do it as part of a larger hospital-based system, they still need the same skills, but the outcome might not be as palatable because it might mean essentially even going further down the acuity scale and taking on the, tr the very, very risky population almost exclusively. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. Okay. Um, I, I think the the one of the things that they're going to be really good in terms of relatability is they understand that they have to put so many resources in and somehow it's not balanced out in their PPS. So, yeah. so PPS has been just adjusting at one percent or two percent or three percent depends on right. you know health rate for years. Um, they got a big bump a few years ago because of a lawsuit in Maryland, uh, right. <laughs> um, which was the, the one time, you know, it really did work, um, and it was it was really rational, and then they got the bump um, in the PPS rate. rate. But um, even them costing that out to see that, you know, is the rate covering the cost? Yeah. would be really a good analysis for them to do individually to right. see where the, uh, that rate is really the rate. Or, you know, again, under an ACO model and contracting as a collective group with the managed care, you can end up a lot better if you know what you're doing <laughs> than yeah. higher yeah. than GPS. Um, so it, it's just whether or not they're able to do that. I do I do love, yeah. the, um, I love the slides. Go ahead, I'm sorry. The other the other thing about about staying um tethered to your PPS rate and again maybe it is not as much of an issue in states where the department has been more uh friendly toward, you know, looking at increases in the rates and, you know, easy ways to apply for scope changes and rate adjustments. Um, in many states, and California is one of them, um, it's been very challenging for health centers to 
want to implement new care models, um, you know, uh, you know, new tools and resources and workflows because the risk to them has been very high about proposing those changes yeah. and actually having, upon review, having their rate reduced. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it, it to some degree can provide, yeah, it can, it, it can slow down in some states and in some situations the type of innovation, like Andy's talking about here, seven LCSWs to one MD, you know, because if, if you're going to risk your, essentially your whole rate for the, you know, on the hope and the prayer that the department's going to see eye to eye with you, you know, it's not always been a risk people have been willing to take. Yeah. Um, so what ends up happening is, well, you know, what always ends up happening is, you know, health centers, because they're scrappy, will try to find ways to do it anyway, but then they end up, you know, then it just becomes a sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul scenario within their own internal operating budgets. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it, just having the conversation is, is going to help them. It's, it's a great slide. It's, it's, it's really good to hear. And what it does is it validates them to know that, you know, that the behavioral health change, that, that ratio is going to, it, it may look a little different at your health center than another health center, but it's really that you're, 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 you are doing cost savings, that you are helping. But needing to understand right. how you make that argument is really the, is the factor. Well, in this particular health center, just to be clear, in order for a patient to even become a patient of theirs, they actually have to have been asked to leave another practice for noncompliance. That's almost uh, like a rule for entering it. And so the average, the average, you know, two-year or one-year um, uh, historical medical expense for the practices that, I'm sorry, the patients that this practice serve is over fifteen thousand dollars. So, oh you know, you're talking about a population of patients where all that application of enabling service, all that application of licensed social worker and other behavioral health um, intervention, you know, you could theoretically per patient save eight thousand dollars a year. If, yeah, I mean, if this, if, if this framework patient, which a lot of our patients are, they're just, they're not negotiating. They're, they're, our health centers aren't, they're not positioning themselves. They're not able to tell the story. So, yeah, right. it's a framework, right. but it's been, you know, Betty Sue who just always comes here. She's on her seventh child. She's been, she's a great person. She brings us apples from the farm, whatever the story yeah. is. It is a train wreck. <laughs> Betty's in the IC, I mean, she's in the ER all the time. So if That's you're right. able to save that managed care company some money, as Betty Sue is always there, and they're paying from the hospital. But it's, it's, again, not looking at it as a systems approach, but looking at, oh, well, Betty just who comes here every now and again, not seeing the larger picture. So a great slide. Yeah. Great slide. Okay. All right, I'm going to turn it to Amanda to talk about the models that we're seeing and that we work with. So, go ahead, Amanda. Right, and, you know, kind of given where we are with time for today's discussion, I guess um, what I'd like to do is kind of walk over these at a high level and, and just know, Dwayne, we could, we could effectively um, bore your members to death with, you know, excruciating detail about any of these models. What I will say is that, you know, what I think part of what's really important for folks to understand while we start to talk through what, you know, kind of what the prevailing models are that we've seen starting to emerge is helping them think through some of these, you know, sort of if we were to function as a health system, how, how would we determine which of these models make the most sense for us and what would be some of the iterative steps? that we'd, we'd want to take in order to put the kind of infrastructure in place. Um, so this just sort of says, you know, at a very high level, you know, we're talking about ACOs, managed service organizations, independent practice associations. And then, you know, the fourth piece that we don't go into a lot of detail on typically at this stage of the game, but is around, you know, developing um, formal partnerships with NCOs, um, essentially, um, you know, 
building a, a plan together, you know, with an entity. Um, and I think, you know, the each one of the networks, um, pr- primarily with the three that have, you know, that are primarily focused on, you know, sort of the network development side, have a different type of function, although there are some overlaps in terms of functions and to some degree organizational structures, particularly when you talk about IPAs and ACOs, there are um, there are some things that are very similar in terms of, you know, provider and patient attribution dimensions that aren't necessarily, you know, part of the service lines that might be offered through an MSO. Both IPAs and ACOs have... Um, uh, an emphasis on the participation standards that need to be monitored and are, um, you know, that folks can become eligible or ineligible depending on their ability to meet those standards. And with both of those, there is to some degree a pooling of the financial risk relative to the quality outcomes as well. Um, IPAs, as you know, because your, your members are, um, really involved in this already because of how mature their managed care market has been, that this is really um, an opportunity to get together to negotiate contract rates, um, to come together as a contracting entity and to have the protections and, the, you know, required from the FTC and other legal um, protections to allow them to do that type of collective um, uh negotiation, um, that's what that structure is exclusively set up to protect um, those entities for and to protect their partnership or the members of those um, of the IPA from assuming those financial risks individually as health centers. ACOs are a little different. Um, ACOs, you know, I think we're going to talk about it in more detail, but, you know, ACOs are uh, – I like to call them, you know, their care coordination organizations wrapped in a payment methodology. Um, again, these are provider-led organized health systems that are looking at a blend of cost and quality and managing against that total medical expense for those patients. Again, you're going to be very specifically looking at individual attribution of patients, and so, you know, data really becomes God with this model, also with the IPA, but in particular with the ACO, and new types of data, including things related to, depending on the ACO program that you're involved in, you know, may include a whole range of um, beneficiary engagement data, it will include total medical expense and claims data, so that there are, depending on how which type of ACO folks are engaged with, they're going to have very different program requirements, and honestly, the governance structures of these entities may look slightly different. Um, MSOs are entities that are formed that or build off existing infrastructure that may already in play, be in place, for, you know, for in entities such like yeah, health center controlled networks and group purchasing entities and things like that. And this is really a way just to pool their scale for economies of scale. Um, you know, we we want to, let's say, we want to pool resources on a compliance program or we want to pool our resources for, for, for provider credentialing. I mean, the list of what the services are that could be um, offered through an MSO are only limited by really what the health centers have identified and prioritized as their most important needs. Unlike IPAs and ACOs, MSOs don't typically um, need a new governance structure, um, and they don't typically require participation standards and inheritance. So a lot of times the MSO model becomes for networks that are less comfortable working together or who have particular um, areas where they really feel like pulling some resources would help gain that economies of scale become a relatively low impact way of doing that. Okay, so go ahead and move forward. I'm going to um, I'm going to move quickly through this so we can talk a little bit about the Starling process, Dwayne. So just know that there's a lot of um, information and background information around each of these models that's both in these slides, and we have a lot more information as well. 
So I'm actually, Andy, is it okay with you if I skip these case studies so we can get a little bit into the content of the three? Yeah, I think the, you know, the, the, the only point that we want to make on the case studies is there's no one right formula. And, you know, you mentioned that you, your, your members went through somewhat of a troublesome, you know, pursuit to build an IPA. And, you know, I think a lot of that in our experience, because we've worked with other groups that have struggled to do just that, um, mm-hmm. really comes from identifying the things that have the most immediate value and just, you know, taking that first step before yeah. jumping in and trying to contract. So, you know, we, we've worked hybrid models. We've worked with, you know, unilateral. We've worked with groups that said, no, nope, it's, it's IPA or bust. And, 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 you know, what are the, what are the pitfalls? We can, we can certainly help work through getting there, but, you know, understanding that sometimes it's just getting them to commit to working together on one thing and one thing only um, and use that as a platform to build on. That's very good. Yeah. And I think, yeah, and I think the other, you can skip ahead to number 37, but I think the other thing on, oh, go back one more, I'm sorry, 36. Um, the the other thing is that particularly in markets where if they have engaged in some of these other models, like you might have members, for example, who are participating in a CMS, ACO demo um, with other, you know, other vertical systems in their region or they might be part of an existing contracting network or an IPA already. Sometimes we'll get questions as we start to go through this process. Well, what does this do? What does this mean relative to some of the other regional activities and other regional networks I'm already part of? So, uh, you know, again, a, a lot of how the service lines are structured, um, what their key objectives are, even even for IPAs and ACOs, um, can build upon regional infrastructure if it's there, can be complementary to that regional infrastructure if it's there. Um, but, you know, so there, to, I think to Andy's point with the case studies, it doesn't, you know, it, it, there, these models can be an amalgam um, for, you know, kind of sort of existing resources in need, but it, particularly with ACOs and IPAs, but even with the MSOs as well, if the scale isn't there, it's going to make it harder and harder to make the case and to demonstrate that return on investment. Yeah. I, I, so the I love, MS, the, oh, go ahead. No, I, I'm loving it. We do have, um, we, we have some ACOs that are in the area, and I know that several of them were in, the, in you know, different conversations with them um, at different points. It has really a lot to do, I mean, mostly to do with them just coming together as a group, and I'm hoping – Again, that the activity itself will show them we are stronger together. There's no other way to really do this if we're not majority kind of on on board on something. Um, right. And, and so I, I I don't think that they're not going to do that. I just um, because they have tried a little bit, and then when I say they've tried an IPA, all it means is a group of them have got together and said, okay, we're going to form an IPA, and then one of the people in the group said okay, and I'll lead the IPA. I can be the CEO. And then they're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. First, you know. So, so, you know, we try to, you know, at a high level define what each of these networks are and give folks some sense of, um, you know, when it would make sense for our network as as you know, as disheveled and fragmented as it is to be thinking about what we might be able to leverage from each of these models. So, again, MSOs really are, you know, entities that provide an infrastructure for some co-management of key functions that help them leverage that economies of scale. And uh, when we talk about this with the members, we walk through some examples of of MSOs that we've helped to develop as well as to identify a range of service lines that this might this might tap into. You can go to the next slide. Um, you know, typically there are some times where you can think about an MSO having a real impact on the group. Um, a lot of what we're seeing is that um, our health centers, um, kind of to the middle arrows point, 
um, in this new environment are really being expected to implement, process, business, and clinical requirements that they have never really been expected to implement before in order for them to actively engage. And I think the one that we've hit on many times today that really punctuates this point is this whole issue around data collection and aggregation and reporting. Yeah. So, um, you know, there there may be very good reasons why an MSO structure helps to leverage that. And um, and then to the bottom arrow point, it's it's a it's a beginning nascent incremental step into a larger vision of building a network. And many MSO service lines fit very nicely into infrastructure that needs to be built out for both the IPAs and the ACOs, um, you know, things like provider credentialing and revenue cycle management and coins processing and, you know, all those, and even provider education, I mean, all types of, you know, services that would be beneficial to the payer or to the, you know, to the ACO could essentially be embedded in MSO and to some degree be contracted out to those entities if they already exist or, you know, the MSO could, provide a jumping off point if the group gets more, you know, decides to get more mature. One of the things that MSOs are good for is if your group isn't, doesn't quite have the appetite for um, clinically and financial, financially integrating with each other because of, you know, past history or, or very real and significant, um, you know, variations in terms of cost and quality performance management, um, MSOs can provide a slate of services that would essentially work to start to equalize that a little bit um, if and when they decided to take that next step. And obviously, it's also if it's not palatable to start enforcing participation standards with a group of folks that are working together, the MSO doesn't require that. So, you know, it's, it's got less of a um, – of a it, you're basically paying to play. If you don't need the services um, beyond the basic services the MSO provides, then it's there's there's no harm, no foul to you. You're not you're not being held um, to any of those. Um, uh, you're not pooling any of your risk, and you're not putting anything on the line. I like it. Any so, other questions? Oh, go ahead. No, just really a quick question. So, are you seeing, or have you all seen? Some of the PCAs, um, when they're trying to talk about, I mean, we as PCA directors have been talking about this for a while, just some of the problems of, of, of connecting with our, our membership around data and how difficult it has been for people to share that. Um, yeah. Have you seen that, yeah, that that's has been more palatable to MSOs first before they got into the IFPA development? and allowed for, um, like, I, I call it just baby steps, kind of like what you were referring to, Amanda. Have mm -hmm. you all seen it been palatable to people? I think what's happening is people, um, PCAs, and Andy can jump in too, but people, both at the, uh, folks at the PCA and the, at the CHC level are realizing very quickly if they don't have a good data infrastructure yeah, and they don't have, um, you know, some of the some of the ACO models, um, both what we're seeing at some state levels that are providing some infrastructure, um, you know, per member per month uh, payments, you know, to help support infrastructure. If folks don't have that data infrastructure mm -hmm. for IPAs and ACOs, it's it's a very expensive and somewhat politically painful proposition to yeah. try to get there. But the bottom line is, and Andy always says this really well, data is the currency of health reform. And so if, if we can start a dialogue, you know, you know, at an, at an entity level that just talks about how can we get better and how can we create an organizational structure that, that will maximize your performance management without pulling any of your risk, that's great. And some states have been able to get earmarks to help fund that you know, for their networks. Other, you know, other folks have leveraged grant funding or have done a combination of self-funding and grant funding, but the reality is is that without that backbone, it's going to be very difficult um, 
because what will happen is um, health centers, as they start to integrate with these more vertical models or as they start to work with their payers, they're they're going to be held accountable for data that they can't necessarily defend or refute. Yeah. And and so it really comes down to who do you want owning your data, and then there's a tremendous amount of work that can get done to clean up your data, you know, before it gets submitted on, and are we making sure that, you know, does an entity like an MSO or an MSO function within an IPA or an ACO provide us a way to kind of get our ducks in a row before we're sending everything off. Um, but I think that's the center. And it always scares the hell out of people, Blaine, when we start to talk about what does this cost, yeah, you know, based on the number of sort of estimated um, uh, live and estimated health centers. When people see what that dollar amount is, they pretty much feel like throwing up because yeah. it is, it is, it's expensive, but, again, with, Without being able to to collect that in a normalized way that you know helps them truly manage against those cost and quality pressures, it's going to be impossible for them to engage with payers or you know for you know for you guys to do the work you want to do around APM. I mean, it's just going to get harder and harder. So I'm, I'm almost up on time. So Andy, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. No, I think that, I, I really do think that does a, a pretty good job, Amanda. I mean, it's 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 not the be all end all. This is not the thing that's going to um, ultimately position them fully for the types of financial arrangements that I think they want. But you know, it sounds like there's some scars from past attempts to work together, and and probably is a a, a better first step. And yes, other PCAs are essentially taking this as a first step. Um, for all the reasons that Amanda kind of articulated. Okay. So let's, let's just pick, oh, go ahead. So it, it's just very helpful to hear that. So thank oh, you. yeah. So let's move quickly to slide 39, and I'll try to get through these very, very quickly since we've talked a lot about this already. But um, an ACO, you know, again, this is, you know, a provider-led care coordination model um, where folks come together um, to try to improve that patient-centeredness and reduce waste within that system and um, identify a methodology for sharing savings when those cost and quality outcomes are met. Um, the next slide talks about when you should consider forming an ACO. And I think, you know, the, really depending on where networks are in their development and what some of the scale issues are for those patient populations, um, a lot of the decision will come down, I think, to what types of options are you being presented to, with. For example, you know, and Andy likes to talk about, you know, one of the greatest um, missteps for health centers was not very early on figuring out how to participate in the CMS advanced payment programs that, you know, came online very early um, for the Medicare ACO program because it, in, it had some incentive dollars attached to it to help build out some of that infrastructure that we've talked about. And it, there isn't any indication on the horizon that those that, that type of a program is coming back. But what we are seeing um, is some states will be applying for waivers or are already implementing um, models for Medicaid ACOs that, you know, will move their expansion populations that do come with some infrastructure dollars. So, again, if if your states begin to put, you know, pressure on your Medicaid population or, you know, or even we're seeing now commercial ACOs start to germinate, um, then it really makes sense to sit back and say, based on those patient populations that would be attributed in under that particular model, how much scale can we have, and do we think that um, we can build off some existing infrastructure that we already have around um, some IPA contracting? I think, you know, again, to the point and one of the notes that I had made before we even started talking today, Dwayne, is one of the litmus tests is do you have an infrastructure that's in place that, you know, can help you um, with this making this decision about whether or not this type of model might work, and then are you willing 
to you, this is the royal you, the network's you, is the network willing to share risk, enforce those participation standards, and in the case of Medicaid and Medicare ACOs, are they going to be willing to participate in the public reporting requirements that those programs will um, require of them? Um, we we talk a lot when we start to talk about IPAs and ACOs, and I'm not going to go into it because I'm already up on time, but um, we talk a lot about the role of the governance structure in this model and in the IPA model. And, you know, we get a lot of – sometimes we'll get the question, like, can we just build the ACO off the, I, off the PCA structure or, you know – and, and the and the reality is is that the require the program requirements for how the governance structures the governance boards are structured um, would more than likely add you know particular representation that aren't on your current boards and so part of the litmus test on the ACO and IPA um, sort of do we want to go down this route really also has to do with what do we really think about governance and how is that different from what we're used to and what are our comfort levels around these shifting governance models. Mm -hmm. And when we go into a lot more detail with folks about teasing these out, you know, particularly when we're talking to folks, you know, in an interview structure and things like that, we really try to get to those um, those pain points for people because particularly in groups where there's been a lot of not-so-positive history, the issue of representation in these governing bodies um, – can can become one that can create a real concern. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to move on quickly through IPAs. I, I feel like you guys have a pretty good grasp on this. Um, so, uh, you know, again, you know, the big difference with an IPA is really around its function of um, facilitating the, the joint contracting. Um making sure that there is a way for that IPA entity to assume the financial risk to um, that would be owed back to payers and that that risk doesn't fall, you know, on the shoulders of the individual provider practices, in our case, the, the health centers. Um, but this is one of the more challenging models because of all of the regulatory and legal hurdles that need to be cleared relative to um, providing those protections for uh, the Federal Trade Commission. Um, should have mentioned this. The AC, with the ACO model, at least with the Medicare ACO model, our program, um, the providers participating in those are granted a safe harbor. Um, but with the IPA, we don't have that, and we need to be able to um, demonstrate that the financial and clinical integration of services through this entity um, actually improves the overall, overall outcomes to the point that that contracting entity can then sort of stand up and say, you know, the population, the health and the cost for this population are better because we came together um, than had we worked separately. And so... Um, Again, we have lots of information on IPAs and can walk through some real experience with networks of health centers that have come together and what some of those issues were. As with the ACOs, um, willingness to share some risk and willingness to enforce participation standards um, and dealing with those governance issues will be one of those things that they would have to um, sort of churn through. But in an environment like the ones that you've been discussing, increased emphasis on either commercial contracting or commercial style contracting begins to build an imperative around why it's so important that we come together around this contracting piece. And that is, you know, a major, you know, one of the major functions that the IPA provides. On slide 2045, and I know I'm over time, so I'm going to move quickly, um, I, I, I think this is something, Dwayne, that you and your folks are aware of, but there is a... Um, there are more sophisticated models of IPAs and um, the legal requirements that um, and hurdles that networks have to clear um, as it becomes more financially and clinically integrated. Um, you know, the level of um, shared contracting and the types of negotiated rates that may be recaptured through that contracting process um, 
become more sophisticated as the as the integration becomes more sophisticated. Mm-hmm. So I know I just went really quickly through those three. Um, again, we've got you know we're consultants, so we have thousands of slides on this stuff. Um, <laughs> the next the next slide. I, you know, I think it's important also to discuss with you guys and also to discuss with the, with the members. Um, it isn't, oh, let's see, slide 46. It isn't always easy to do this, um, even, even separate from some of the, uh, political and historical challenges that we might have to overcome in this process. Um, you know, having discussions around establishing and maintaining standards um, that will be more stringent than what they're typically used to in their traditional membership association model of interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, this whole idea of drag-along, tag-along with, you know, some health centers, you know, it's invariable that there's going to be a divide, you know, in terms of performance. And, you know, what does that mean? And how do we structure these organizations to be as inclusive in the beginning as we possibly can? But over time, understand that if we want to stay relevant to these groups that we're negotiating with, we're going to have to make sure that those standards continue to keep moving sort of up and to the right and that not everybody's going to make that journey together. Um, and if they, it, you know, or they're certainly not going to make it all at the same time and in the same way. And what is our role as the collective in supporting that? And are we truly committed to that idea that we're better, stronger together than letting everybody else, you know, just kind of float out there on their own? The other big challenge, which I've talked about several times already, is really around this issue of what are we going to do about our governance model? And it's why very early in the process we start to try to get a sense where people fall out on that. Um, operationally, we've got, you know, a whole slate of services just around helping folks think about once we decide we do want to move forward, how do we operationalize this? And that's not simple either. You know, it, it's you've got to develop operating budgets. You've got to have, you know, shared staffing. You've got participation agreements, financial arrangements attorneys that we've got to sort things out with, legal entities we have to set up. And that comes with it, you know, sort of do you have a group that sort of has the stomach for not just sitting in a room and patting each other on the back saying we did a great job in coming together as a network, but then do you really have those operators who are, you know, going to be willing to sit down and help stand these entities up and get them moving and functioning so that they're providing the highest amount of value back? And then, we also know that timelines at both the state and the federal level are pressing on us, and um, we're feeling different cycles of pressure points depending on which, you know, which program we're talking about, you know, which cycle is, you know, affecting us the most right now. But having to do this at a time where, we're, you know, I always say we're building an addition while the kitchen's on fire. Mm-hmm. So we have to be somewhat comfortable with the fact that those pressure points are going to be bearing down on this as well. So I'm already over time, Andy. I don't know. Do you want me to keep going, guys, just to talk a little bit about process, or do you want to stop since we're over? Uh, I'd like us to stop for right now. You all have done a great job of giving us, uh, more information than I thought I was going to get. So <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I, I think um, what I, I would like to do is um, to kind of debrief with uh, Jeanette and with Betsy a little bit about this with how to move it forward and then come back to you guys. This is what I think is going to happen. So two weeks from now or three weeks from now, three weeks, I think it's three weeks, uh, we have our strategic planning retreat. At the strategic planning retreat, this topic is on one of the many topics that people have already said, hey, we need to have some kind of conversation about shared data needs, uh, possibly our term of payment methodology, what we want to do with that, blah, blah, blah. So there's going to probably be a task that will come back to the PCA, which is, Dwayne, go and research how we can do this thing. Right, which is then all I'm going to do is come back to you all 
and say, hey, I'd like to engage you in a contract to do exactly what you just did today. <laughs> and then, <laughs> but with the group. Um, but before we do that, I want you to meet with, you know, this group and this group and maybe two or three other people and, and have some conversations so that when you do this presentation with the full group, that it, and it may be an in-person presentation is what I'm, what I'm assuming with the, the next phase. Um, it may be, it, it might be another um, webinar only because people are geographically everywhere, so it might be another mm -hmm. one of these. Um, but I think after that, it, they'll say emphatically, okay, we want to move forward with um, doing a more in-depth analysis of what it would take to either form an IPA, an MSO, or what, what, what do we need to do, guys? And I think that's where your advice, given what, you, what you've seen in the country, would be very, very invaluable. I think the other piece of this is what is the role of the PCA if they decide to assist with the IPA right. development, with whatever. So our PCA right now, just so you know, we're kind of, Following, of course, Minnesota um, and our friends Craig on Oregon uh, with teaming together with somebody that can help us do some dev repository kind of thing. I don't want to become an IT company. That ain't going to happen because um, I'm going to be here for exactly two and a half years before my daughter graduates from from high school and then I'm, I'm out and I'm going to do international law like I wanted to do 12 years ago. But anywho, I digress. Um, so, so I'll be here for my for my two and a half years, in that time, I think it's imperative, A, that they start sharing data, B, that it has some kind of shared network that can pull from everybody's EMR and that we're able to really do some cost analysis and do some data collection and really do some analysis so that if IPA is where we want to go to, then the PCA can have a role in helping with the data portion of that or helping with doing some kind of education contracting back with the IPA, but the IPA formation and all that, I think that's kind of inevitable. I just think that this is the very first step to helping everybody else realize that. Does that make sense so far? It yeah. does, and, you know, we have a bunch of stuff that, not a bunch of stuff, but if there, we have some stuff on sort of the role of the PCA and the pressure points of the PCA that might be helpful in later discussions with you and the staff internally um, to sort of think about what's the best way to tee some of those issues up with your members that doesn't, you know, feel like you're – I mean, it just depends on your members. You know, some PCA have relationships with their members who are, you know, willing to do anything to make sure that the health set or that the PCA can transition, you know, as well. Um, others have a more acrimonious relationship. I came from California, so trust me, I get that piece. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> oh, I do. And uh, they have mixed feelings what they, they, what they wanted the PCA to do. So, um, uh, so I think that, you know, if you need, if you want to talk to that some more, we can get some additional things. Dwayne, if there's anything we can provide to you in advance of your strategic planning session with your members, some context slides or whatever, just let us know. Uh, that would be really helpful. So I think what I'm going to do is meet with the team. We'll we'll talk about it. I know there will probably be some additional slides that I might ask you for for IPA specifically uh, at a very generic level. I think your your earlier slide that had um, when we talked about the value and you, and you basically said it's quality, the service, some type of capitation, partial or full or whatever, or a bundled service agreement. I think that slide is going to be a good slide. Um, we're going to utilize, you guys know Roger Chauvenier? 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 Is that how you say it's Roger's name? Roger used to be with NAC, and now he does consulting out in Bethesda with a lot of different uh, PCAs and whatnot. But he's been around health center space for a long time. Okay, Roger, great. He's going to be our facilitator for, for strategic planning, and I'm going to be talking to him more about this. I think any, uh, um, I know I'm going to probably ask you for, some context slides relative to the PCA and the role that the PCA can play or have played in helping the health centers. My my goal is I'm not too worried about our PCA in terms of being a PCA and, you know, having money and all that. Um, 
we, we have a really good team that knows how to write grants. And so we're going to be writing a lot <laughs> for next year. So right. we can diversify our funding so that anything that happens at the federal level has no real impact on the PCA. But we are a PCA, and we're here to represent the health centers. So I think the other big piece is how can we be helping them educate them as much as we can through contracting with you all to help them figure this out. Because if they don't figure this out, we won't be here because they won't be there. We'll be called something else. Right. We won't be called the PCA. Right. Right. So there'll be no right. Be two health centers that are the conglomerate health centers, one for Maryland and one for Delaware, um, you know, right. or, or something crazy. Um, and so um, this has just been a, a wonderfully rich conversation for educating us, so I really want to thank you all. You all did an excellent job of giving us some real good food for thought. So we're going to kind good of deal. talk and then – Probably by next week, early next week, I'm away this uh, for the PCA strategy session on Wednesday through Sunday. I'll be gone away for that, um, and I am going to be attending uh, one meeting on this that's going to be happening on Wednesday. I'll probably try to stop into that uh, when I get off the plane uh, to that meeting. But my goal would be that we could talk again uh, by early early uh, next week and, and kind of okay. flesh out a in terms of next steps. That sounds okay. great, Dwayne. And I know I think Andy had to go, but he um, yeah, he will. I you may run in. Okay, so go ahead and go, Andy. It's fine. He he will be down in Florida as well, so you might run into him there. Oh yeah, that'd be great. So, so. yeah, we'll, we'll, so um, and I know he always likes to put people together, um, you know, who are like minded on some of these issues. So I'll make sure to loop with him if he if you guys run into each other to know that that's on his radar. And then, of course, we'll be at P&I because I think Mac has us facilitating some discussions on this stuff with, you know, some breakout group or some or other. But hopefully we can talk before then, you know, to kind of figure out what you might need. And, you know, just give us a sense of what you need, you know, to sort of arm yourself with good information for your strat planning. And, um, you know, we'll try to, you know, put it in the kinds of uh, bite-sized pieces that you feel like, you know, you know, that are going to be consumable for them in that environment. I don't want to send you 3,000 slides. That's not useful. So, <laughs> Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I, I think I really appreciate that, and I think um, obviously I'll talk to Andy while we're down in Florida. Um, right. But I, I do think a, a few slides would really be extremely helpful to help direct some other conversation around this. The conversation might just be like, hey, yeah, Dwayne, we want the PCA to do more around this and, and, and tell us more information. Then I might be saying, okay, I need you to do this presentation, but instead of it being a two-hour presentation, it needs to be an hour because they, you know, have adult ADHD and they can't, they can't focus right. too long. <laughs> but this is the last five right. slides. Right, right, right. Three slides and then add these last five slides and then open it up for questions and then they'll be good to go. Um, exactly. And But I do know that we're going we're gonna to end up working together because I, the reason why I started talking to you guys was that three of the three of my board members that are also three of the people that are my that have committee members <laughs> said, Dwayne, you need to start, start getting geared up for IPA stuff because we want to do this. And I know the rest of the group won't say yay to this yet, but you can make them say yay. So. That's great. Well, um, good luck in Florida. Hopefully it will come with some warmer weather. Yeah. And um, <laughs> and hopefully that will make up for the fact that you're in Florida. I don't like Florida. And he's like, do you want to go? I'm like, no, I'm fine. Um, but uh, And we'll, we'll, I'm sure you guys will connect when you're there, but we'll definitely look to loop, you know, back next week and see what we can do to get things moving and also to get – you armed with some stuff for your session with Roger. Perfect. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. Y'all have a great no night. No trouble. All right. Take have care. a great one. Bye. Bye-bye.